Wolf covering my name, Steve Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live and a very prophetic broadcast this evening. And, you know, yesterday, guys, we were speaking here on our news broadcast about Abraham being a father of many nations or many goim. Because, as I said before, uh, oftentimes, as I sat in many Jewish homes of uh, friends that I had, uh, and the time would often come where the expression of, well, they're just goim, the Gentiles. Uh, it is a very derogatory term used by many of the Jewish people that I know and have been associated with down through the years. Uh, and something that I had to come to terms with to realize that the goim is something that Abraham is the father of. And we should never look down upon the Goim or the Gentiles because Abraham would become a father of many nations or many Goim, many of the Gentile people. Uh, the only reason we ever see in the case of Isaac and Ishmael that there was a preference placed on uh, Yitzhak or Isaac is because the promise of the Messiah would come through his lineage. It's very evident in the very life of uh, Yeshua when he's on the earth that uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees, uh, the Pharisees, he actually said, you are of your father the devil. Well, they also claimed to be Abraham's seed. And he said, sure, you're Abraham's seed, but it was their works. You have to understand, <coughs> excuse me, there was a faith seed that God was looking at. And it would come through the loins of Abraham, through his descendants, but it would go down through the side of Isaac where that promise would be made met. Or as we read in Genesis, the woman's seed. All right, it's actually the woman's seed. And what is it? It would be that there would be a woman that would not doubt God's word, but would believe God's word unconditionally. Eve doubted, and therefore we ended up she believed the lie of the devil and caused you know between her and Adam together they caused the, the the downfall of mankind put us in the predicament we are today and Sarah was given the opportunity to to believe God without question but still wasn't sure didn't fully trust God and give Hagar to Abraham and we it brought forth Ishmael now Ishmael Abraham loved him and God loved him as well. But the thing is, is God knew that through the seed of Isaac, there would come forth actually a woman that would believe that would bring forth the promised Mashiach. And that was none other than Mary. So when Genesis says it would be the woman would see that she would have her seed would hate this Satan's seed. That's very true, very true. And what's odd is the fact that when Yeshua says, you are of your father the devil and his works shall do, we find out there was a bitterness, a hatred, an enmity, as it's written in Genesis, uh, between children, that were people, Pharisees that were truly of Abraham's lineage, but did not have that kind of faith. They did not have the right faith. So as I just, as I bring it as a reminder, I, I said to you the other day, when we look at this passage here uh, in the book of uh, Genesis, neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham or Abraham. See, excuse me, Abraham right here. Ki of Hamo on Goim, because you will become a father of many nations, okay, that I have made thee, Natatecha, actually, that I have given you. All right, it's not even made, it's what he gave you. I'm going to give you, I will give you many Goim. Now, that would come through the faith of his lineage, and of course, Mary believed, and conceive that child and Yeshua the Mashiach who would believe unconditionally as well would bring about the redemption. Now, I want to share with you, I said I wanted to go and <clears throat> as I've mentioned already there's so much going on in the nation of Israel today uh, we are certainly hijacked 
by a bunch of leaders that are just as blind as blind can be. The setup of 2,000 years ago is once again today happening in the state of Israel. And many of my evangelical friends and uh, Christians of all walks of life, you support Israel, you love Israel, but you're not doing it with wisdom. You know, instead of supporting them for the gospel of Jesus Christ to open up the eyes of my people, Instead, we support politicians that send more bombs to blow up all of our neighbors, all of Ishmael's children, who are also Abraham's children in the Middle East. And so I told you I wanted to show you this is what we need to do in order to really wake up the children of Israel because if we can get my people to recognize the truth, they wouldn't be persecuting the believers of Yeshua in the state of Israel. Oh, they praise the evangelical community to stand behind President Trump to arm the nation to do more and to take down Iran and to blow up everybody in the Middle East. But the problem is, is this is not the way Yeshua would have handled it. No, Yeshua would not be down there at the White House is one of the advisors to President Trump. I hate to tell you, but he wouldn't be. And I know firsthand that the evangelicals, especially the elite of the evangelicals, are working to bring you to a new world order. You should come to Kansas, you'd find that out. I know that firsthand because I know the very people that are high-ranking evangelicals, United Nations spokespersons, that are backing President Trump, New World Order, connected together with a Roman agenda. Yeah, they're setting you up for the same thing as it was 2,000 years ago. But the problem is, what you don't understand, the Roman system of 2,000 years ago persecuted Jesus Christ to death and all of his followers. Where does that put you then? If you are supporting the same Roman system... If you're supporting Israel under the Roman system, and Trump is also supporting it under the Roman system, you are persecuting the believers inside of Israel. Unknowingly, you're doing it. Okay? I mean, listen, friends, a lot of evangelicals are just like Paul was 2,000 years ago. Saul was just as blind going around persecuting the church and didn't realize that he was persecuting the very people that he would eventually love. He was headed to Damascus, to Syria, to bring them all in. What are we doing today? What does the Christian community today do? You've, got, you've even got Amir on his channel. He tells you that Syria has to be taken down. All right? Well, maybe he's a lot like Saul. You know? He, maybe he really thinks like Saul does. He's willing to go to Damascus and wipe them all out. But friends, we can't do that. And I pray the brother, his eyes will open up as well because he needs to own an awakening like Saul did. He needs, his, he needs that uh, Damascus Road experience where his eyes will come open and recognize that this is your brothers over there. Not just the Christians, but the Syrians as well. That's Laban's children. Do you not realize that our father, Isaac, our forefather, his own mother Rebecca Rivcha says to Yitzhak Isaac, Don't let my son take a daughter from among the people here, but send him to our people. Who were, who were their people? The Syrians were. Take a daughter from, from my son from there. Leah and, and Rivka, excuse me, Rachel and Leah, both Syrian girls. All right, so I want to take now, I want to show you from the story of Joseph, the most beautiful story of redemption. All right, so that I can, this is what we need to be doing. This is what we need to do to open the eyes of my people. 
And maybe Israeli News Live, this is the way the channel began years ago as a teaching channel and people loved it, believers. But you know what? You know what has been a blessing about becoming Israeli News Live and, and really taking a stand? God began to deal with me as well. He began to open my eyes. He opened my wife's eyes because we were very diehard Zionist ourselves. Not that we wanted to be part of the elite side of Zionism, but we believed that the coming back to the land and that Israel has full rights to the land, not knowing that Palestinians, many of them, have Jewish bloodlines, they're descendants of Abraham, not knowing that, yes, part of them are Egyptian, but yet the Bible says the Egyptian would believe in the last days, and the, Assyr the Syrians would also believe in the last days. So I got caught up in the blindness of supporting blindly the state of Israel as well, forgetting the fact that the government of Israel, you know, Netanyahu, and, and, and I know government officials there, you know, not to forgetting the fact that God had said that they would be blind until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. All right? So let's, let's start doing some eye-opening here. Let's start waking up the people. Let's start, because I've had many rabbis sit down and listen to the things I'm going to share with you now. And even as I was going over the story again about Joseph, more and more God reveals to me, constantly pouring it out. All right? This is the type of things that is going to be in the book. What have rabbis missed? But more and more, I'm beginning to think, what have the Christian pastors missed? Because I missed a lot as well. Let's go right into it. Genesis chapter 37. Uh, now I'm going to be reading from the King James Bible mainly because I have a lot of my notes in here. So, and I'm going to spot read some of this for you just to save time. So we want to go here to Genesis chapter 37 verse 4. Uh, and we know that God, or excuse me, not God, but Joseph uh, was sent by his father to check on his brethren. Uh, he was very beloved of his father. Uh, Isaac and um, and so he sent excuse me Jacob uh, his father Jacob and so he sent him down there to check on uh, you know or you know excuse me uh, because Joseph was uh, born of Rachel uh, who he loved very much and so uh, but anyway in verse 30 excuse me chapter 37 verse 4 we read here and when his brethren saw their father loved him more than all his brethren they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph uh, dreamed a dream. And actually, let me, let, me, let me back up. Verse 3 is where I wanted to go first. Now, Israel loved Joseph uh, more than all of his children because he was the son of his old age. And he made him... Now, this says here, they translate that a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Now, literally, the word in, in Hebrew that is used here for the coat of, quote-unquote, many colors is kotanet pasim. Pasim literally is not the word for many colors. It's actually, it's like diver's links. It's long, long to the sleeve, long to the ankles, and one thing that has just really stuck out in my mind is if you look in the Gospel of John chapter 19, when Yeshua, when they're, when they're parting his garments among them, the Roman soldiers are, they come to his coat and they would not part that. They cast lots for his garment because his coat was seen from the woe from the top to the bottom to the end of the sleeves to the to the palms all the way down to his feet there and I have always wondered if Joseph's coat is not very similar to that of Yeshua or Jesus's coat there but at any rate you know they never could they hated Joseph and of course he was also because he was a spiritual man he saw dreams uh, and would interpret those dreams and and one thing I've always found interesting in his dreams there's only one of his dreams that never came to pass in his lifetime and that was where he had the dream of uh, the stars and the moon and the Sun would bow before him and of course it the, the moon and the Sun represented his mother and his father and his mother died before they ever came down to Egypt not like in the case of the story of Joseph's brothers where they come down to Egypt and they do bow before their before their brother as well as does his father but his mother does not come uh, and I've always thought that that was kind of interesting doesn't mean that it's not going to be fulfilled 
That's what I find because to me it's a resurrection prophecy uh, to where they will all come to him. Because the greater Joseph, of course, is the Mashiach, the Messiah. And I believe that when Yeshua rose from the dead and those saints that raised up with him, no doubt, as his Bible even says later, that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. So there is coming the day where the 12 brothers, or in this case the 11 brothers, and including Joseph in that case there because he was a type of the Mashiach the type of the Messiah they will all bow before him and they will all confess that he is Lord so that's where the fulfillment of that scripture will actually come in it's not that it was a false prophecy it's just as fulfilled in the Messiah himself because it was a type of Joseph all right. So as we move on down, though, uh, they really they, they they got to where they just hated him. And Joseph's father, uh, Israel or Jacob, sends uh, sends his son down to check on his sons uh, to see how they are doing. Now I kind of find this fascinating as well because there's a lot of biblical types in that. And, uh, you know, one is just like in the case when the three angels came down to Abraham, they came down to see what was going on, of course, in Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, and in this case here, it shows that the one that stayed with Abraham, of course, was none other than yod heh vav -Heh, the divine name of God himself that stayed behind and spoke to, to, to Abraham. And I see Joseph here is a type of Yeshua, the coming of Yeshua, when he would also come in a future period to check on the children of Israel to see how they are doing. And of course, in this case here, it would be for redemption, just as it was in the case of Joseph, even though they would sell him out, it would be for the purpose of redemption. But there are several things, though, that I want to share with you that I think that are, that are very interesting. Uh, also, if you go to, say, verse 18 in chapter 37, and we'll scroll down on here and see, I think it's maybe the same in this one as well. And they saw him afar off before he came near unto them, and they conspired against him to slay him. He said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him, and cast him into one of the pits, and we will say, An evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. That's pretty much what happened on the cross. Remember that? Remember when uh, Yeshua cried out? And he said, I thirst. And they said, No, let him alone, let him alone. Let's see whether or not Elijah will come and save him. They really weren't sure, because Yeshua also had dreams and visions and did prophecies and they wanted to see because they weren't really sure if he truly was the son of God or in this case here an anointed son like in the case of Joseph so they wanted to see and in this case they wanted to put an end to his dreams because they didn't like the idea that he would reign over them all right but it's not so much for a reigning as the purpose of the fact that he would bring about redemption. And so, I, as you go on, we read that, And Reuben heard it, and, and delivered him out of their hands, and said, Let us not take his life. I always like that about Reuben, because Reuben literally means, See a son. His name really means, like, Behold a son, or see a son. And this is what uh, Leah named him, uh, because she wanted Jacob to love her. And so when she gave birth to Reuben, you know, she named him Ru, uh, Reuben, you know, behold, Reuben, behold uh, your son, behold, my, your, here's your son. And so it's interesting when you think about this in Hebrew, because every time you say a name, it literally carries a physical meaning. And I think that's interesting about Reuben's name. Uh, but anyway, so it goes on and he says, uh, Reuben said, Shed no blood, cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, but lay no hand upon him, that he might deliver him out of their hand and to restore him back to his father. This is what Reuben wanted to do. It's a very noble thing of Reuben. And it came to pass when Joseph was coming to his brethren that they stripped Joseph of his coat, the coat of many colors, or the coat of diver links, diver's links, that was on him, which is the same thing the Romans did to Yeshua. And they took him and cast him into the pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes, and looked, and behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels, bearing spicery, balm, uh, landum, landum and, and going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What prophet 
is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our flesh. And his brethren hearkened unto him. And there passed by the Midianite merchant, and they drew him and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, and they bought Joseph uh, brought Joseph into Egypt. Now, let's clarify something, because a lot of people mis totally misunderstand what happens here. And you kind of have to have the book of Jasher to, to connect the dots here, because Genesis doesn't fully tell us the whole story. Joseph's brothers were going to sell him to the Ishmaelites. But then suddenly the Midianites come and they take him out of the pit. Well, if you read the book of Jasher, what happens is while they're negotiating to sell Joseph to the Ishmaelites, yes, the Midianites do come by. They see Joseph in the pit. They take him out. And as they're going away, according to the book of Jasher, Joseph's brothers stop them and said, what are you doing? This is, this is our, our servant. They make it look like he's a slave and not, you know, you know that he's not their brother. And... Uh, and the Midianites, you know, they said, well, we found him. You must not be a good servant. We've taken him off your hands. Don't worry about it. Well, according to Jasher, Joseph's brothers, uh, I think it was uh, Simeon and Levi, uh, said, you know, hey, we will tear you apart if you don't give our, give our slave back to us. And so they got afraid of them. And because of their supernatural strength that they had, that's what Jasher shows a lot of the supernatural strength of the children of Israel, the 12 sons of Israel, how they were very different ones, had different uh, abilities. And so in the story there, we find out that the Midianites uh, agreed to give them uh, 20 pieces of silver for their brother. And they sold him to the Midianites. And then the Midianites, we find out, according to Jasher, they got afraid because they said he was too comely looking of a boy. Uh, they were afraid that he was royalty and that they had just lied to him. So they didn't want to get caught in the deceit here. So they sold him to the Ishmaelites for the same 20 pieces of silver to recover their money. And the Ishmaelites actually take him down to Egypt and sell him to Pontifer. Uh, so that's kind of a little interesting part of the story that we don't really get to see. And again, this is something scholars have always pointed out. As Joseph was sold, so was Yeshua sold for 30 pieces of silver. Uh, and, you know, we know the rest of it. You know, it's like uh, he dies because his death going down into Egypt, he was considered dead. Now, I also find very interesting, as we move down in the story, though, is that after this happens, Reuben returns to the pit and Joseph is no longer there and he rents his clothes. Uh, and they took Joseph's coat and they killed a he-goat. They dipped, it, dipped the coat in the blood, according to verse 31, uh, and they sent the coat of, of many colors or, you know, of divers lengths, and they brought it to their father and said, This have we found. Know now whether it is your son's coat or not. What a cruel thing to do. Very cruel, no doubt. Very cruel indeed. And when you look at the story of, of Yeshua, of Jesus, though, same thing's happening to him. He's been sold out by his own brethren, by the children of Israel, you know, and, you know, and the, and the sad thing is, is look, look, go back and see who does it, though, too. Um, Right here. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it to slay our brother and conceal his blood? It was the house of Judah that actually, they didn't want the blood on their hands. And so they said to the Roman authorities, It's not customary for us to put one to death. But he's worthy of death, speaking of Jesus, and they handed Jesus over to the Roman authorities to put him to death. Well, even in the book of Jasher, we find out that the brothers said, in the book of Jasher, as it expounds on this story, if the Ishmaelites take him down and sell him down in Egypt, he'll, he'll pretty much come to nothing. He'll end up being killed by the Egyptians down the road, right? So... That's interesting. Judah, just like in the house of Judah, did this to Yeshua, Jesus, so Judah did it to his own brethren. All right? Now, so at any rate, they send their, their, his coat, kill a lamb or, or goat, pour the blood of the goat on uh, the coat, send it to his father to identify it. Yeshua, after he was sold out, Jesus was sold out by his brethren, his coat's taken off, it's sold, it's, they cast lots for his coat, right? 
Now, in the case here, though, then Joseph leaves from the presence of his father. And the very secret of the sin of Joseph's brother are born in the body of Joseph as he goes. Now, I believe this is where we get the Yom Kippur story that Moses gives later. I believe that God put the Yom Kippur, the sacrificial goat, and the scapegoat in the, in the law as a memorial for what happened to Joseph and as a future look at what would happen to the Mashiach, to the Messiah himself. Because what do we do in the case of Yom Kippur? On Yom Kippur, we have two goats that are brought before the congregation. The priest confesses the sins of all the children of Israel upon Azazel. The goat that is to be taken far from the people and let go into the wilderness. Like in the case of Joseph, right? But the other one, they are to kill the other one and he becomes the sacrificial goat and he bears the sins of the people. Now one carries the sins far away, the other one loses his life for the sake of the people. And to me, that is a perfect analogy of what happened in the story of Joseph. Because in Joseph, they killed that goat. That goat, who did nothing wrong, had to die because they're trying to hide their sins. And they take the coat and say, is this your son's coat? Yes or no? And of course, he assumes a, a wild beast has devoured him. And then Joseph, all the while, is bearing their sins and their iniquities in his body and goes down into Egypt. Now what I do find fascinating is later when they go, to, uh, go down to Egypt to buy corn, which we'll get into in a moment, it's interesting. Well, I'll just save it till we get to that point there. Uh, but at, at this rate here, the same thing happened with Jesus when he was here on the earth. The only difference is, is he became the sacrifice as well as the scapegoat. When Yeshua was put to death on the cross, he was that Lamb of God that was slain. He was the one slain from the foundation of the world. And he, he became the blood that was sprinkled upon the people. And at the same time, he rose up again. And he bore the sins of the people very far away. And in fact, if he had not borne those sins of us today, where would we be? Because for the last 2,000 years, there has been no sacrificial service held. You know why? You didn't need one anymore. Once the true lamb had came, once the true sacrificial lamb had came, there is no need for sacrifice any longer. He took it away once and for all. All right? Now, bear with me, my Jewish brothers. Rabbinical brethren that are listening, maybe in secret, I know many of you do, but bear with me. All right? Because this has got to, we got to really... Listen, time's running out. You think what our government's doing in Israel is right? You think to oppress the stranger is what we're supposed to be doing? I don't think so. God never accepted this. Then bear with me. All right? On over. So. We'll skip over to chapter 39. And uh, as we look at chapter 39, and Joseph was brought down to Egypt... Uh, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's, uh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him uh, of the hand of the Ishmaelites that had brought him down uh, thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him. And the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found favor in his sight, and he, and he ministered unto him, and he appointed him overseer over his house, and all that he had 
he put it into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he appointed him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord's blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the, and the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had, and in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, having him knew not aught save the, the bread which he did eat, and Joseph was a beautiful form and to fair to look upon. Now, verse 7, And it came to pass after these things that the master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. Now, we get this, this is just a little quick stop I wanted to make on this section here because there's a couple of things I find interesting in this. You know, one, uh, kind of like in the case of Pilate and Pilate's wife. Pilate's wife recognizes that Yeshua, Jesus, was a godly man. Uh, and she tells her husband, have nothing to do with this just man. I've suffered many things in a dream already. But you have to understand, though, the Romans, when it, and this is a little bit of a kind of a different way to look at this, in Nicaea, Rome, in 325 A.D., you know, several hundred years after Yeshua has already left the scene, the Roman authority wanted to mix Christianity with a Roman version. And this is where the Catholic Church was actually born from that there. Uh, and... I find this very interesting because it's also like in the case of uh, when Joseph is fleeing Pontifer's wife and she grabs his garment and it tears. Uh, you know, that's another similarity in there. Of course, Jesus' coat is not torn. They said they didn't want to tear it, so they cast lots for his, his, his coat uh, that he had that was woven from the top to the bottom, according to John chapter 19. But it is interesting to note, though, that she constantly tried to entice him to sleep with her. And the reason being was to pervert the word, to try to break the strength of who Joseph really was, the honor of who he really was. And this is exactly what Rome wanted to do all along with the gospel of Yeshua that came forward. And they did finally succeed in 325 AD. They did finally succeed in perverting uh, the word of God when they mixed it with Nicaea Rome. Uh, and it just really turned into a major mess. But as we go on, you know, we see in verse 12, that's where he, she catches his garment. Uh, and, you know, so I, I just kind of wanted to bring that out. But he ends up, uh, Joseph ends up in prison. And again, he is a, a, a spiritual man. He sees the dreams and visions. He prophesies of uh, the butler and the baker, what's going to happen to them. But there's an interesting sign that I want to share with you that I find interesting is that the, the, the butler is restored to his butlership. He's going to deliver the wine once again to the king. But the baker, of course, he is hung. He's put to death for his crimes. And, but as, the, as Joseph is still in the, inside of the dungeon there, he says to the, to the butler, uh, and this is over in chapter 40. So let me just kind of jump over there real quick here for you. Chapter 40. I don't have them all open as I normally do. Uh, come on, where is it at? Where is the mouse? There we go. Chapter 40. Uh, we get down to verse 15 here. And make sure it's the right verse here as well. For indeed, uh, okay, so verse 14. But have me in thy remembrance when it shall be well with thee, saying this to the butler, and show kindness, I pray thee, unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house, or out of this dungeon. For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and where also have I done nothing that they should put me, in, uh, put me into the dungeon. An innocent man, right? And Yeshua was innocent. He had done nothing wrong, but was falsely accused and sent to his own death, just like in the case of Joseph. Falsely accused by uh, Pontifer's wife because he refused to sleep with her. And that, you know, that's really the same thing that Yeshua was. You could, you could take it, forget the part about the Romans in Nicaea, Rome. Yeshua refused to sleep with the Pharisees and Sadducees. He refused to bring about an idolatrous 
worship of the Word of God. He refused to accept Talmudic tradition of the oral law and to accept that as the canon of God's holy word. As he said on many occasions, you know, these things you do, like the washing of pots and cups, he said, many of these things you do. And he said, and you, you do it, but you, do, and you won't bear a single thing yourself. He said, you make, yourselves too, you make your converts twofold more the child of hell than you yourselves. You see, so Yeshua was among them. And notice, even in the case of Pontifer, when Joseph was in his house, everything was being blessed. The same thing with Jesus. When he was here on the earth during his ministry in Israel, the people were blessed. The lame walked, the blind could see, the, the deaf got their hearing, and, and of course the hungry were fed. And the gospel was being restored. The, the, the Tanakh, the Torah, the laws of God, and the, and the prophets were being restored, what the word said. And it, it was a Karite gospel is what it was. That's another thing that gets me today, friends. My Christian friends, you're supporting a Talmudic tradition when you support the state of Israel and, a, and, and Netanyahu wanting to make the Talmud the law of the Jewish state. This is not what Yeshua came to do. Yeshua came to, as a Karite Jew. He came believing only the word of God. Right? Right? And because he refused to marry the traditions of Pontifer's wife, so to speak, of the Pharisees or the Sadducees, then they falsely accused him and sent him to his death. Now, I'm going to show you how beautiful it gets, though. Yeah, Yeshua wouldn't accept it. He would not accept the Talmudic tradition. He would not accept the oral laws. And isn't it interesting? Joseph was condemned on what? An oral word. Her word against his word. Jeez. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> and you know it's interesting. You notice how the, the veil was rent from the top from the bottom? And Joseph's garment was torn as he fled now so we go back and we see this and uh, he says to the to the baker the or excuse me to the butler he's saying to him remember me i've been falsely accused i shouldn't even be here and so when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good he said unto joseph i saw in my dream and he gets his dream and of course his dream is not so good he's gonna he's gonna be killed it's gonna be hung right now here's what happens though after this happens uh, the, the chief butler is restored back to his position. And he gave the cup to Pharaoh's hand, according to the prophecy here in verse 21. But the chief baker was, was, uh, was hang, the chief baker got hung, and Joseph, had, as he interpreted his dream, and yet the, the chief butler, he didn't remember Joseph, but he forgot him. All right? Now, I want to show you what happens next, though. Let's go to chapter 41. It's the timing that's fascinating, right? And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. Then he has the dream of the, of the seven uh, years of plenty and the seven years of famine. And he cries out, to find out what the interpretation is. And so finally the butler comes up. And let me just find where it's at. Verse 9, as we come up, after he talks about these dreams. And then spoke the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I make mention of my faults this day. Pharaoh was wroth with his with uh, his servants and put me in the in, in the inward of the house of the captain of the guard. Me and the chief baker, and we dreamed, uh, dreamed a dream in one night, and I and he, and he dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. But notice, though, it's two years before he finally decides to remember 
Isn't that interesting? All right, so we go over here to chapter 41, and this is what really gets interesting right here. And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. Now, this sets the timeline right there. Joseph had been forgotten for the past two years. As he says, because remember, in verse 23 of chapter 40, yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. How long did he forget him? For two years. Two full years. Now, according to the Bible, a thousand years is one day with the Lord. So, in the last two thousand years, Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, has been left in a dungeon by the Catholic Church. Uh, that's one to think about, isn't it? And, but what has the Catholic Church been doing for the last 2,000 years? They've been a very busy body in being a cupbearer. And the only reason they can even bear the cup is because of the prophecy that Joseph spoke about the butler. That he would once again be restored to his butlership and he would also bear the cup before the king of Pharaoh. And I kind of think it's interesting because the cupbearer, even though he's forgot Yeshua, he forgot Joseph in this case. What's he doing? The Vatican today is bearing the cup for an Egyptian Pharaoh and not for the God of Israel. What do you know? What do you know? 2,000 years Joseph, who is a type of the Word of Almighty God, a type of divine revelation, divine interpretation, hidden in a dungeon, while the, while the cupbearer, the butler, is strutting around like he's somebody. He's the butler before the king. But when the king has a problem like we have today, we have a problem. We have a famine in the earth today. And who's there to gather the grain in? Who's there while right now Monsanto has been destroying the very essence of the seeds of life that God commanded in Genesis, let every seed bring forth of its kind. But you have allowed through your government policies, and let me tell you something, the congressmen and the senators that have permitted Monsanto because of the kickbacks that you get to destroy the life that God gave you to multiply grain and to let the common man even multiply grain to feed himself with, you have totally destroyed it. Instead, your little Pharaoh cupbearer out there who forgets the word of God that has the ability to tell you what's going on leaves Joseph in a dungeon just as you left Jesus Christ in the catacombs of the Vatican. I say the catacombs because I'm sure you got some ancient documents in there that a lot of Christians would love to know about. Yeah. What do you know? Anyway. We will move forward. So. Unbelievable. Now. As, as we moved on, we see though that Joseph, you know, he raises up. He interprets the dreams of Pharaoh accurately. And those are going to be seven years of famine as well as seven years of plenty. The seven years of plenty, of course, comes first, followed by the seven years of famine. And that he needs to seek out a wise and just steward that would know what to do during that seven years of plenty. Because the time would come when the whole world would be famined. And you know, we know the scripture says that the day would come they would no longer be uh, no longer be a famine for bread alone, but by hearing of the Word of God. Kind of makes you wonder about the last 2,000 years that Rome had control, doesn't it? The cup bearer. And they're still bearing the cup as he did in Obadiah, fulfilling Obadiah's prophecy in 2014 when the Pope of Rome went and had a communion service there on Mount Zion in the upper room, fulfilling the prophecy of Obadiah. Think about that, rabbinical brethren. Now, so we go on. Joseph, you know, 
he says that you need to find a discreet man and of course the Pharaoh says is there any man that's so discreet in all of Egypt and so he appoints Joseph to be the one over everything you know and you know speaking about that famine that's where it is in Amos let me just I'll take you to that real quick as I, I mentioned that earlier that Amos we should look at Amos Amos chapter 8 Right? And he says here, And he stayed yet other seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark, and the dove can't, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, nope, 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 am I in the wrong chapter? Let me just see. Wrong book, sorry. I knew, that's interesting, isn't it interesting? Seven days? There you go, seven days and before the dove comes? Wow, never, didn't ever think about that one before. All right, Amos, chapter 8. All right? We'll start with verse 6, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes and sell the refuse of the, cor of, of the corn. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their works. All right, must be, oh, I'm sorry, verse 11 is where I got to get to. Start with verse 10 then. And I will turn your feast into mourning and your songs into lamentation. And I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins and baldness upon every head. And I will make it as a mourning for an only son. The end thereof is a bitter day. There's Zechariah's prophecy. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from north to even to the east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. <laughs> and that day shall there, the fair virgins and the young men faint for thirst. Yeah, because the last 2,000 years you had it hidden. And until the two witnesses come, because remember, what did Yeshua say when he went up there on Mount Transfiguration and Moses and Elijah appeared to him there? It wasn't, no sir, it wasn't Elijah and Enoch, it was Moses and Elijah because Moses represents the law. And he came back down and they said, I thought the scripture said that Elijah is supposed to first come. And Yeshua said, truly Elias shall first come and restore all things. A restoration's got to come. Why? Because you had him imprisoned in the, in, in the Vatican for the last 2,000 years. And of course also by the evangelical doctrines and Pentecostal doctrines, you still keep him in prison. Now listen, I love you guys. I'm not here just to pick on people. I'm trying to get you to know the truth of what's going on. Quit letting people tickle your ears. All right? So, so Joseph was held in there, but then he comes out and he begins to do, he begins to gather in. And we find out, uh, as, as he comes out, his father, the whole world is in famine. Just like today. We're in famine too. You know why? Because you let your leaders sell the world bombs instead of feeding the world. Anyway, Joseph's ten brothers came, went down to buy corn into Egypt. And if you look in the book of Jasher, I kind of find it interesting because Jasher notes in there that they remembered Joseph and they went they separated themselves to each one of the gates and they went looking for him. And you know where they went looking for him according to the book of Jasher? His brother has said, as, far, as good looking of a boy as he was, you'll fi find him in the prostitute's house. <laughs> Isn't that like Israel today? Because today Israel is looking for the Messiah in the house of the prostitutes. I say prostitutes because they perverted the Word of God. The Vatican's perverted the Word of God. Many of the churches today have perverted the Word of God. And so the rabbis are looking to the Vatican for the answers, to be the answer for Christianity today, which is the house of a prostitute. But you won't find him in a house of a prostitute, my rabbinical friends. He's not in the house of a prostitute. All right. So anyway, that's what it says in the book of Jasher. And Joseph, 
when he saw his brethren, and he knew them, but made himself strange unto them, spake roughly unto them, and he said unto them, Whence come you? And they said, From the land of Canaan. Let me. I'm sorry, I don't have that up on the screen for you guys. That's in chapter uh, 42. We didn't. I didn't change it over. I apologize. Let me get that done real quick. We're in chapter 42, and we're down here about verse 7 here. All right. He made himself estranged unto them, and spoke roughly with them, and he said unto them, Whence come you? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew him not. Same thing with Yeshua when he came. He was there, he was among his own brethren, but his brethren, they, they couldn't recognize that he was truly the Son of God. You couldn't recognize that he was the Anointed One. Yet he was right there among you. And Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them, and said unto them, You are spies to see the nakedness of the land are you come. And they said unto him, Nay, my Lord, but to buy food for thy servants have come. We are one man's sons. Right? Now, gets interesting. Get down to, um, let's see. We keep moving down. And... Trying to remember right where I need to go at you next. Go down to verse 15. We'll pick it up again. Verse 14. And Joseph said unto them, That it is that I spoke unto you, saying, You are spies. Hereby you shall be proved as Pharaoh liveth. You shall not go forth hence, except your youngest brother come hither. They tell him about their estate, because he asked them, you know. Uh, and they say that they are, you know, they have. Let's just read it. Let's just read it. And he said unto them, Nay, but to seek the nakedness of the land, you are come, is what he says. And they said, we, we, are, uh, we thy servants are twelve brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan, and behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is not. And Joseph said unto them that it is I spoke unto you, saying, You are spies, hereby you shall be proved as Pharaoh liveth. You shall not go forth hence, except your youngest brother come hither. Send one of you, let him fetch your brother, and you shall be bound, that your words may be proved, whether... There be truth in you, or else uh, as Pharaoh lives, surely you are spies. Right? So he says, And he put them all together in the ward for three days, and Joseph said unto them, For the third day, this do, and live, for I fear God. Now that's fascinating right there. Three days he had them in there, but on the third day he delivers them. Now you have to really understand this here, because this is the most beautiful a passage, in my opinion here, is that three days. Now, I'll tell you why. Simon, will find out later, Simon is going to be the one that he's going to bind and hold over as ransom, right? We'll get into that in a minute. But anyway, he says, to, he puts them all together. All, all of them are put in, put in prison, basically, for three days. And then he brings them out on the, in the third day, and he says, This do and live, for I fear God also. Now, if you go and you look at Hosea chapter 5 and, ver and chapter 6, look at the end of chapter 5. For I will be unto Ephraim as a lion, as a young lion, into the house of Judah. I even I will tear and go away. I will take away there shall be none to deliver. Now that's, that's speaking of both the house of Israel, Ephraim representing the house of Israel, and Judah representing the house of Judah. So God says he's going he's to deal with both of them like a lion. I will take away and there shall be none to deliver. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. In their trouble they will seek me earnestly. Now, there's your prophecy right there. God says, I will go and return to my place. That means that God must have come down in a human body and spent some time with his people there. You get it? Because God is going to return. All right, right here. Elecha Ashuva. What? God is going to return? He had to have been here then. You say that God's never been among us? God can't be a man? God can be whatever he wants to be. And according to this, he's going to return El Hamakumi to his own place. So he must have been among us. He must have been among us, right? And he says he's going to go back to his own place until we acknowledge our guilt. What guilt? 
Well, he came to his house. He came to his temple. Doesn't God always... Didn't he, didn't he say he would come? Didn't he promise Moses that he would dwell in the temple? Didn't he say to us he would meet us in the temple? That's why you got to get in Christ. He is the temple of God. He was the temple of God. And he returned to his place. Right? And he says... And seek my face in their trouble, they will seek me earnestly. Yeah, they're the, the leaders of Israel are about to bring some serious trouble upon us, so we're going to certainly be seeking him earnestly. And it's not just the house of Judah, friends. It's going to be the house of Israel, too, that's all scattered in all these other nations because these wars that are coming upon us. Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. What? After two days. Will he revive us on the third day? He will raise us up that we may live in his presence. And let us know eagerly, strive to know the Lord. His going forth is sure as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the what? The rain, as the latter rain and that watereth the earth. O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto you? For your goodness is the morning cloud, and as the dew that early passeth away. I'm, I'm, I'm almost speechless when I read this. The former and latter rain. The former and latter rain is the teaching of Moses and Yeshua and Elijah was there in the form of John the Baptist and heard the teaching of Jesus Christ. He's the one that's able to restore it. Not to mention Moses and Elijah on Mount's Transfiguration. They're watching the whole thing that's happening to him. They both know. And Moses, is, he's got to come because he's got to show the Jews that there's no such thing as a Talmudic law, that all this is nonsense. That you passed on an oral false tradition. Oh my gosh! So he was among us according to chapter 5 because he has to return to his own place until we acknowledge our guilt which was handing him over to the Roman authorities. Right? In the third day. What third day? The house of Israel was scattered 2,000, almost 2,800 years ago. We're in the third day. There's your third day. They've not been regathered yet. And we're not going to be regathered to the natural state of Israel. We're going to be gathered in Him. Into what? The temple. What temple? His body. He said, I don't dwell in a temple made with hands, but a body has thou prepared me. Remember what the prophet said? Alright, now, I'm going to prove it to you. I want to prove it. Let's go to Exodus 19. Alright, Exodus chapter 19. And it's important, friends, because, you see, God wanted to do this for us long years ago, but we refused. So he's doing it all over again. Exodus 19. Go down to verse 11. We'll start with verse 10. Let's go to verse 9. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, and the people may hear when I speak with you, and may also believe you forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them uh, today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments... And be ready against what? The third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. Oh my gosh. And even Sinai is a, is a thorn bush. God appeared to Moses in, in, a, in a thorn bush. And Christ on his head was a thorn bush. And God spoke from the midst of the thorn bush. And on the third day, and, and Hosea prophesies in the third day, He'll revive us again. We'll be gathered together. Everything about the story of Joseph is showing the story of Christ. So he says right there, going back, let's go back then again to Genesis 42, right? 
where was it again? Verse 17. And he put them all together into the ward for three days. See? And what happens on that third day? And Joseph said unto them, In the, the third day, this do and live, for I fear God. They'll come out of the prison. We'll all... See, it's not just... Listen, this isn't just the Jews that are in a prison. Satan's got the whole group in a prison. Why does he have to send two witnesses? Why does Elijah... Jesus said that Elijah has to restore all things. Then there's something missing, friends. Don't think the Jews are the only ones blind. It ought to be obvious that the Christians are blind when you're sitting there supporting a Talmudic tradition for the state of Israel. It's not just the, uh, the Jews that are blind over there that don't recognize the Messiah. Instead of standing there with the believing, the Christian believing Jews of Israel that are about to be thrown out of the land, you're supporting a state that wants to pass a Noahide, a Talmudic law across the world that'll behead Christians. Have you never seen where all the Orthodox Jews coming out of the FEMA headquarters? Oh my gosh. And then you support ministers, Jewish ministers, that are supposed to believe in Yeshua. Instead, what are they doing? They're over there training FEMA to be able to behead you one day. Their eyes need to come open as well. All right, so Joseph, you know, he takes, when he says three days you'll live, now watch what happens here. Let's go to verse 24. And Reuben answered them, saying, spoke, uh, oh, wait a minute, and, and they knew not that Joseph understood them for the interpreter, because see, Reuben was saying, I told you, I was saying, do, do not sin against this child, and you would not hear. They, they realized that what they did to, 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 to Joseph was wrong. There's coming a reckoning soon, friends. And he turned himself about them and wept, and he returned to them, and he spoke to them, and took Simon from among them and bound him before their eyes. Do you know that Simon was given his name by Leah? Saying that God, you know, that, that, that um, <laughs> when he binds him right there, that his, part of his name means to hear. Simeon. When, when he was born, his mother giving that, that God is hearing her cries. But now Simon is bound. In other words, like a type of your, their hearing of Israel was bound. Mm. Then we get down as they as they go back, they're going they're on their way. Joseph commands them to fill their, their sacks with, with, with the corn and to restore every man his money. Why? You can't buy your salvation. Isn't it interesting when you get down to verse 28 and he said unto his brethren, they get they, they stop by a hotel. What? Right? Let me back up. One of them opened a sack to give his ass provender in the lodging place. That's literally in Hebrew, Babylon, right here, Babylon, at the hotel. And he spied out his money. was in the mouth of his sack. Right? And he said to his brethren, my money is restored. Lo, it is even in my sack. And their hearts failed them. And they turned trembling one to another, saying, What is this that God has done unto us? Why did it happen at a hotel? Why at a hotel at a Babylon? Because Christ was rejected at the hotel first when Joseph took Mary and Yeshua was still yet in the womb. And the very first place he was ever rejected was in the very hotel. They said there was no room for him in the end and they sent him to a stable to be born. All these are types and shadows laying in here for you. Right? Oh my, it gets more beautiful. Alright, then of course you know what happens. They go on and then they, they come back down later because the, the food doesn't last forever. So, and... Um, so as we get on down, we have to go to chapter 43 next. You know, 
that Jacob, you know, they're, they're back and Jacob is saying they're starving to death. They got to do something. And they said, well, the man said that we cannot return unless we bring our youngest brother, Benjamin. Benjamin had to be there. Benjamin represents the last days of the Israelite people that would come in. He's the baby brother, the youngest one. In the last days, when that last remnant of the house of Israel and the house of Judah will be here on the earth today, they will come down. And when the last remnant is here, Joseph will demand to see his brother. And of course, they brought him back. Right? And we find out as they bring him back, we find this in chapter 43 and chapter 44. And Joseph wanted to dine with them. That's in chapter 43. We get down to around verse 24. And uh, he releases to them. Let's see. Benjamin allows Joseph to go, or Benjamin to go down. He, he doesn't like the idea, but he allows it. The man brought the men to the Joseph's house and they gave them water and they washed their feet and he gave their asses provender. And they made ready to present against Joseph coming at noon for they heard that they should eat bread there. And when Joseph came home, they brought him the present which was in their hand. They brought back the very money that they found in their sacks as well as extra money. You know what that's for? You know why twice the money comes? Because Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver and Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. They're having to pay restitution for two different times, but you can't buy redemption. That's why in both cases, Joseph gives the money back. See? And they asked them of their welfare and said, Is your father well? The old man whom you spoke, is he yet alive? And they said, Thy servant, our father, is well. He is yet alive, and they bowed the head and made obeisance. There's, there's those twelve sheaths, or the, you know, the, excuse me, eleven sheaths bowing before him, just like he had seen in the dream. He lifted up his eyes and saw Benjamin, his brother, and his mother's son. He said, Is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke unto me? And he said, God be gracious unto thee, my son. And Joseph made haste, for his heart yearned toward his brother, and he sought where to weep. He entered into his chamber, and he wept there. He washed his face, he refrained, he came on back. But as we know the story, what happens though is after they eat and everything, next morning he sends them out. And what does he do? He puts his own cup in the bag of Benjamin. Now Benjamin is the son that is not guilty of anything that ever happened to his brother. Just like the Jews today say, we were not 2,000 years ago. We had nothing to do with the death of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. We had nothing to do with this man. So why is everybody holding what, he, what happened to him against us? It's held against you because you do. See? We have to, we have to make atonement. Right? So, he took and he put his cup in Benjamin's bag, the innocent Jew of that day. And also because God knew that Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, would be part of the house of Judah that would betray Yeshua in latter days. It was also Shimei who was a Benjamite that rejected David. But later in the story of David, comes back and repents and cries for mercy. There's a lot about Benjamin that we do not recognize. But see, God knew. And that's why he put that cup in Benjamin's back. As well as we saw what happened at the communion table when Esau would betray Yeshua at the communion table. And this is why the cup was placed in Benjamin's back. Because Christ would be rejected at the communion table. And here they are having communion together. And as a foreshadowing of a rejection of the house of Judah, Benjamin carries that cup within his sack. It's found within him 
And of course, they are all hysterical over the fact that the cup was discovered there. And they come back. And then finally, as we know the story, Joseph finally reveals to his brethren, be not angry with yourselves. Let's just listen. We can go to that one, one part there. I think it's in chapter 45, though, before we get into that part, after this has all happened. And he says to them, then Joseph could not refrain himself before all of them that stood by him, and he cried and caused every man to go out from, from me. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the, and the Egyptians heard, and the house of Pharaoh heard. And the Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph, doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were affrighted at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near and said, I am Joseph, your brethren, whom you sold into Egypt. And now be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Now, isn't it interesting that we also, as I shared with you not long ago in the prophecies, that even the Egyptians will believe here in modern days. The Syrians would end up believing. There'd be a highway between the two. See, if the story of Joseph not only brought redemption to his brethren that had gone blind, how much more the Arabic nations that we look down upon today, that we think that they're just nobody, will not the blessing of Joseph's hand reach out to them as well. There will be a remnant from Egypt, from Syria. There will be a remnant from Yemen, Saudi Arabia. There will be a remnant from Lebanon, from the Palestinians. There will be a remnant from Gaza. There will be a remnant from the United States and from Europe and from Russia and from Africa and South America, Central America and Canada. Do not fail to realize that God will have a remnant in this day that we are living in. Do not persecute anymore, but recognize if you're going to stand with Israel, begin to stand with knowledge and wisdom and stand for the truth of the Word of God. I trust you'll do it. Help us get this message across to the people. There's not many that are willing to hear the truth, but I trust that you're willing to listen and that you're willing to believe and to, to work with us to get this type of message to our Jewish brothers and sisters around the world. Will you do it? Will you do it? You can help. You can pray for us. Most important thing you could do is pray for us. If you want to support the ministry, I'll just make it simple and short. Our website is RaeliNewsLive.org or at the bottom of your screen as we're closing. Let me say the more important thing, though. If you don't know Yeshua to be your own Savior, to believe that He came and gave His life, that He is the Joseph that we read in the Bible, would you like to know Him today? You may not ever have another opportunity. I want to pray with you now that God will open your eyes. If you want to repent for not standing with Israel the right way, even as I have had to repent as well for not standing with Israel the correct way, I pray with you now. Heavenly Father, we come to you, B'Shem Yeshua Mashiach, Ve'anachanu Sho'elucha Adonai, Be Adonai, Please, Lord, Hear our prayers. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our iniquities, dear God. Help our eyes to be open. Forgive us for being against those of your children, the remnant, those that you have called. Even Yeshua himself said when he spoke about how that the enemy came and sowed in weeds amongst the wheat, he said, let them grow together. Your angels will come and do the separating. They do that separating. God forgive us. And if there's any that want to accept you as Savior, I ask, Lord, that you would do something for their heart tonight, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Yeshua HaMashiach. We ask you, O oh Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for your support.
and getting the message of Jesus Christ to the Jewish people and to our Gentile friends all around the world. Shalom.